Heart to Heart, a Catholic media ministry, presents Good News Today, featuring an inspiring gospel teaching by Father Jim Willig. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. And said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. The Gospel of the Lord. The question I'd like to pose to us today is, can you visualize Pentecost? How do you imagine in your mind Pentecost looking like back then and there so that we could visualize and realize how Pentecost happens here and now today? Keep that question in mind as I first would give us some background material to the Feast of Pentecost and hopefully a window to look into that upper room that we could see those disciples and further along providing this window could become a mirror, we could see ourselves. There were three great Jewish feasts throughout the year. The Feast of Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles just as there are three great Christian feasts through the year, Christmas, Easter, and Pentecost. Pentecost meant the 50th, the 50th day, of course, the 50th day after Passover. Remember, Passover was that time when the Hebrew people were freed from the oppression of Egyptians and were set free to go their way into the Sinai desert to become a new people under the covenant. So the Jewish feast of Passover actually celebrated two significant aspects. First, it was an agricultural feast where they celebrated the first Thanksgiving, much like our Thanksgiving, the feast of harvest, the first harvest of the grain or the wheat. But like most other feasts, it took on a deeper in wider meaning. And they remembered the time when they just had entered into the desert and Moses was called up to Mount Sinai and given the law of the Lord. In other words, God established with his people the covenant, which was his commitment of relationship to love to them and asking that same love commitment from them. It would have happened about 50 days or so, a period after they had been released from Egypt. Now, with the Christians, we too celebrate two aspects on the Christian celebration of Pentecost. First, we celebrate the giving of the Holy Spirit, much more than the law of the Lord. It's the very life and the source of love from our Lord. And we celebrate that first great harvest of Christians. That was the very first day that People came to follow Jesus through the preaching and the witnessing of the apostles. So 
we not only celebrate the Pentecost as the 50th day after Easter, but it really, for us, is the first day, the birthday of the church. What happened in the Christian Feast of Pentecost, first Pentecost they went and gathered in prayer in the upper room, certainly is more monumental and far wider reaching than what, in the Christian estimation anyway, than what the Jewish people would have celebrated. Now that is just some background that helps us have a certain look into that room. Now picture that upper room as however you might envision that. And what do you see? We hear in this gospel that first it is the first day of the week. That is to say, it is the day of Jesus' resurrection. We have here in John's gospel the same day that Jesus rises from the dead is the day his spirit descends upon his apostles. John is not reporting a chronology, but more of a Christology. He's intentionally linking these two great feasts of the resurrection and the dissension, of the resurrection of Jesus and the dissension of the Holy Spirit, as being so intimately connected. In other words, Easter is Jesus' victory over sin and death, and Pentecost is our victory over sin and death. It's what Jesus gives us because of his power now that he's won for us on the cross. And so we see on this Easter Sunday, the disciples gather together and they had not yet seen our Lord. They do not yet really realize that he has risen from the dead. If you will, they are still overcome with tremendous grief and sorrow at the death of Christ. It hasn't dawned on them yet that the Lord is alive and among them. The picture that I have as I try to visualize that first Pentecost is a picture that my memory carries of the times that as a priest I have been invited into the homes in the wake of a a family's death of a family member or friend. I walk into the home and ordinarily sit there in the living room or the kitchen and you feel this terrible pall over the whole home as though it's draped in darkness and sadness. More often than not, there's almost perfect silence. People can barely bring themselves to say much at all. Little by little, the family gathers around all the children, and some of the closest friends, much like the disciples gathered together in that room where they last celebrated the Last Supper with Jesus. And what I feel in moments like that is this tremendous sadness when you're with a family that's just lost their beloved and their best friend. And it seems like no one can bring themselves to say much. Hardly anyone can pray other than to cry from the depths of their heart. And no one can hardly even think about eating because so much is eating away at them. And you just sit there in that gloom and doom and kind of try to support each other. You've been there. You've seen, you've been part of such wake services or those moments when you've been with people who are grieving the loss of a loved one. That's the picture I have before Jesus appeared on the scene. And if you can picture that, you can see why we and the disciples needed the Lord so much to come. And then if we could go to the next frame when Jesus appears. Now remember that the disciples would not have had a clue that he would be coming. For all they knew, Jesus was dead and gone. Just like we feel when we lose a friend. And if you say something like, well, you know, he's he's in heaven, he's happy. And it just doesn't seem to make sense right then and there. You know that. And they're just overcome. When Jesus appears, they obviously could not believe their eyes. It was as though they would have seen a ghost. They couldn't believe it. I 
often picture that in my mind in this picture that I have here. Jesus coming through a locked door in the background. And he comes with this brilliant light that suggests this love that envelops the whole room and dispels the darkness. This light that just ushers forth from his heart and his hand is raised in blessing. And the very first words Jesus says to his disciples is Shalom, which is much more than we can hear in the translation of the word peace. It had such a rich meaning. It was a common uh, Middle Eastern greeting, but it would better be translated, may every good blessing of God be given you. And in the greeting is the receiving of that blessing. So Jesus is praying, and as he's praying, he is the answer to that very prayer, you see. Because as he comes into that room, immediately you could sense a certain sadness and darkness and silence leave the room. Because when he had showed them his hands and his side, which is, mind you, not only where Jesus was wounded, but certainly must have reflected their woundedness. You know, when oftentimes when I'm in a home with a family that are grieving, one of the things they do say is, oh, geez, if I only had done this for this person, I wish, I wish. And then you go through all, if only, over and over and over again. Well, you can imagine how the disciples played that one out when they wished they had been faithful to their best friend and their Lord, how they had abandoned him. They, going over and over, uh, the guilt pulling them down as they were beating themselves up. And Jesus comes and shows them his wounds that now are no longer bleeding. You see in this picture, his, his hands, though they bear the mark of the nails, they are not bleeding or hurting. It seems that as Jesus shows them that, he, he's holding out for his disciples the hope of their own recovery. That they don't have to keep feeling this loss in their life, just as we might bear certain scars and can have the hope of recovery ourselves. And then at the sight of the Lord, John says, the disciples rejoice. You could just sense this incredible joy come upon them. And again, he says to them, peace be with you. And as he's saying that, it's, you know, it's happening. More and more, this peace that is dispelling their fear. I mean, they're so frightened. That's one of the reasons, certainly, they would have locked the doors. They were afraid that they were next, that the Jewish people were out to come and get them and crucify them too. So all the worst you can imagine is what they would have felt. That's the picture I get. How about you? Can you visualize this? You have to see the picture in its almost the negative of the picture, to get the full positive view of Pentecost. And then, how I often see this myself is happening today is when I'm with families that have lost some family member, and somehow they pull themselves together, and as a family they come dragging themselves to church for the celebration of the funeral service. And slowly and subtly, almost imperceptibly, but I've come to look for this more and more, and not always, but many times I see this happening. I sense as they come to celebrate the Mass of the Lord's Resurrection, this sense of their faith reminding them that their beloved is not dead, but is alive with the Lord. And in fact, that is the very purpose of all of our lives, to make that journey to be with the Lord in life everlasting. And there is this sense of their presence that, of course, having been overwhelmed by their absence and by the obvious void and the hole in their heart, they sense a spiritual presence that doesn't cover over the hole, but exposes it, becomes less hurtful and more hopeful 
There is in the prayers and songs that are said at at such a massive resurrection, you've attended many, I'm sure, yourselves, when so often we sing, and I will raise you up on eagle's wings, that you sense this burden lifting a little, a little. And as so often is sung too, the words, be not afraid. I can almost hear the Lord speaking and consoling the bereaved family and friends, do not be afraid. Peace. I'm going to take care of you. And I shall be with you always. There is also something that I found happening. Sometimes, and especially some of the children, they will sense that this mission that their, say their father who died, that they now have to carry on his work. That they now have to Remember him, never forget him, and somehow carry on his love and the care of the family and teach their children about what they learned from their father. Does this make sense? It's somehow the picture I get of happening in a much more dramatic way, no doubt, in that upper room that was once a wake service that now they were being reawakened to the resurrection and the effect of Jesus' resurrection is the actual pouring out of the Spirit for them to be raised up with the Lord so they could carry on His work. So that what we see after the upper room experience is the apostles that have been so transformed that you would hardly recognize them. We know that when Jesus breathed on them, he poured his spirit into them. In fact, when John was writing this particular part of his gospel account of this resurrection, we imagine that he was recalling the words of Genesis when God breathed his spirit, remember, into the clay that he formed into man and woman. And the word for breath, ruah in Hebrew, the same word that means spirit, so that this spirit was what brought this first man and woman to become alive. And it is this breath of life, this spirit of the Lord, that brought his disciples back to a new life, a life that was better than ever before. It's a sense that this void that the Lord had left was a sacred space that his spirit would now occupy, that though Jesus would no longer walk alongside of them, he would actually live inside of them through his Holy Spirit. And he would take them and be with them with all people at all times, for all ages, omnipresence everywhere. So it transcends space and time. This is the certainly the meaning of of Pentecost, the Spirit being poured out upon all the earth. Another image that comes to my mind when I think if I were to have a picture of the apostles before Pentecost and then one immediately after Pentecost, when they were before locked behind doors, afraid, scared to death, deep in depression and darkness, and then breaking out of those locked doors to be the boldest witnesses of the gospel, unafraid to lay their lives down, which they did one by one, and brought so many new converts in this great birthing of the church. Somehow, after they'd received the Lord, it's like you wouldn't recognize the disciples. They lost so much of the weight of the world, the burden and depression that had overcome them and tied them down. Now, strong in the spirit, They go out and people didn't recognize these men who were uneducated. Where did they get all this? How are they able to do all this? And the whole Acts of the Apostles is a wonderful witness of the gospel in the second volume of the sequel of Luke to show that everything we saw Jesus doing, now the apostles are doing by the power of the Holy Spirit. Obviously, it is not themselves. That's the picture I have of what happened back then and there. I think the greater and more important question for us today is, so how do you visualize the Pentecost for us 
right now. I think first we have to visualize it in order to be able to realize it and how it does happen for us. How do you expect Pentecost to happen to you this week? First, do you believe it will? Can we really believe that we can have a Pentecostal experience? Perhaps not as dramatic, I would suggest a little more gradual. But as I look out in the window of the church, this is what I see. Oftentimes as people come together at church, I'm reminded sometimes of a wake service because it seems like people are half dead. But not in the most morbid sense. I just mean that what I see is that so many of us, like the disciples, are locked into our compulsions and addictions, our dysfunctions and our problems. And it's hard to break out into new freedom and a new life. You know how difficult that is. You've been locked into those patterns a behavior, haven't you? And it's hard. It seems like it's our weakness. We just can't break beyond and move beyond these things. I see so many people hiding behind fears. Fear, most especially, of love. Of being loved. And of being more loving. Hiding behind the fear of not being able to reach out in service or in witness of their faith, their love. I see people being, like the disciples, held hostage by their own anger, controls them, that they just can't let go of their own hurts in the past that has left these bleeding wounds and scars that they just can't forget and move on. I see people driven into a certain craziness by their lifestyle, and by their greed, by sometimes their own job. And I see the Spirit wanting and waiting to set us free of all of that. I see myself running around out of breath, out of that not full of the Spirit, the Spirit that is our life breath and our energy, I see myself and many of us not living truly at peace with ourselves, our life, our home, our jobs. I see so many of us struggling and wanting to be reminded of what is my mission in life? What is the sense of this, of all of this? I see so many of us hungry, if not even at times starving for the Spirit. I see our entire nation losing its soul, needing to regain the inspiration of the Spirit, to be inspired before we expire and lose that breath of the Spirit. And I see our Lord wanting to come and break through all those barriers, break into our hearts, our minds, and into our homes, and give us everything we would need, spiritually speaking. Give us what we imagine His Spirit to offer us, wisdom to know what we need to do, and the courage to do it. The insight to see what needs to be changed, and the strength to change it. The inspiration to see what we need to see and all the power of God to accomplish it. What I see is that more than ever a deep sense of Jesus coming as he does suggesting in this picture to come to bless us with the greatest blessing there is the blessing of his spirit. That is the source of all goodness and all gifts. That there's never a time from here on out that we won't know that we're walking with the Lord and the Lord is walking and working with us and in us. And that would change our life forever. 
just as it did his disciples. And I imagine that the disciples would never have imagined in the wildest dreams how God would have used them. And they couldn't have imagined how God would have, through them, caused us to be here today through their preaching and witnessing and working and living together as a community. And I wonder if any of us can fully appreciate or imagine how God would want to use us. I'd like to just end with this thought, is that how much He loves us and appreciates the fact that we would come together in His name to study His gospel, to learn His ways, to grow in His Spirit. I don't imagine any of us can fully appreciate how delighted the Lord is that we would give Him so much of our time and attention. And I don't imagine any of us could fully appreciate how much the Lord wants to bless us and give us His Spirit. A greater degree of love than what we've ever yet received or felt or shared or lived and all the gifts of the Spirit that we would need to complete our particular and personal mission in our life. I look at the disciples gathered in the upper room, and I imagine it was kind of a graduation ceremony, a commencement exercise. When they had finished studying with the Lord all those years, and then the Lord sent them out with the degree of His Spirit with them to begin His work, and they set out with that great power at work in them. That's what I imagining the Lord wanting to give us. Not a diploma with paper, but the conferral of the power of His Holy Spirit. Amen. Heart to Heart welcomes you back next week for another inspiring edition of Good News Today. If you are interested in other books, CDs, DVDs, or digital downloads by Father Jim or Father Michael, you can call toll-free 1-877-208-4875 or visit our website, www.heartoheart.org. There, you can also sign up to receive a weekly reminder to listen to these same programs online. And please, consider a donation of any size to help support Heart to Heart's radio and internet ministry. That's www.heartoheart.org or call 1-877-208-4875. Thank you for listening and may God bless your heart and the hearts of all of your loved ones.